it has been over 20 years since I painted the miniature. So as you can imagine, I had a little bit of apprehension before recording this video. Not that I chose something particularly challenging to paint or that I'm a complete beginner, because after all, even if it was on different mediums and on a much larger scale, I do have experience painting stuff. So to make sure I would enjoy this project as much as possible, I fixed myself a few rules. One, as this would be my first Loyalist Space Marine ever, I wouldn't rush it and instead focus on enjoying every step of the process. Two, I would be aiming for something clean, but not remotely close to a competition standard. Three, to make the whole process as frictionless as possible. Well, I did have a few issues and here's why. Most of our painting gear is pretty old and some of the paint that we've been using in the past decade isn't particularly suitable for miniature painting. We do have plenty of Valeo paints and a very few seasonal ones that are still usable. Some of those are actually so old that Scott, aka Miniac, was still wearing diapers when I got them. The thing is, we are not going to rush out and buy a ton of new paints while we're not even sure with which brand we're going to settle. Instead, I am going to walk around the limitations that I have at the moment. And you know what? This might even be interesting because sometimes you have no other options than walking with what you have. All right. Let's get started. For this project, I chose this Space Marine Intercessor. And right away, one massive change from 3rd edition Space Marines is that those miniatures aren't possible anymore and that each part is numbered for easy assembly. I am removing remaining sprue bits and mode lines with my blade and will continue cleaning up the model by using those soft sanding sticks that are available in different grids. Those are particularly great to remove mold lines on round surfaces and I often go back and forth between sanding stick and blade to achieve a nice finish. Of course, I am drilling the barrel and filing the end of it to avoid any bits of plastic sticking out. A little brush off to remove all that plastic dust before gluing body and head together using Tamiya Thin, which is a very good plastic cement perfectly suited to assemble those miniatures. Just make sure that you use this in a well-ventilated area to avoid melting your brain. To fill up any gap, I am using sprue glue, which is made by dissolving some sprue bits with that same Tamiya cement. At that time, I wasn't sure what to do with the base, so I didn't glue it to the miniature. And because I will paint this Space Marine in sub-assembly, I am using a Valero masking fluid to avoid getting any primer or base paint over the pins while still able to paint this model with arms and backpack loosely attached to it. For priming the miniature, I use this 10 years old can of Chaos Black that still works surprisingly well. I am building a Zenito using a mix of Valero German Grey and Pale Grey Blue, mixed with some matte medium for extra transparency. Making sure that I preserve a darker color for the shadows, I spray a few very thin layers all over the model, slowly adding up to brighten areas like the shoulder pads or parts of the legs. Working with transparent layers is key to achieve a smooth finish and is allowing me to use only one shade of gray for both base and highlights. A quick cleanup between colors with water, back feeding using my finger or a makeup sponge, cleaning up the tip of the needle with a bit of isopropyl alcohol and we are good to go. I am going to use Valero Scarlet Red for the armor base color. Again, building up the color by applying several thin consecutive layers. And as you can see, with that bright gray foundation, it looks at first very pinkish, but with each additional layer, the color will progressively gain in saturation and intensity. The color actually got very shiny and a little too saturated to my taste. And while I do like vibrant colors, this is not the look that I have in mind this time. To fix that, I used Evil Sun Scarlet that I thinned down to make it very transparent and spread it over the whole model to achieve a more desaturated and matte look. And here, I just noticed a weird mold line that I didn't see before and that I should have trimmed down. Oh well. Time to pick up the brushes and to warm up my painting confidence, I started with larger elements, like the chest piece that I'm painting in Valero Air Black. I could, of course, have painted the whole mini assembled, but as I wanted this experience to be as frictionless as possible, I disassembled the arms to get them out of the way. Removing the masking fluid is fairly easy by gently rubbing it with your fingers. 
And with the arms out of the way, I can now move my brush much faster and freely without risking touching the pauldrons. I also painted the right knee pad and every armor joints in black. By also removing the backpack, I can easily reach and paint some harder to get areas. Oops, I shouldn't paint that in black. I made a wash by thinning down that same black paint with water and some matte medium to apply it to every recesses on the model, avoiding letting it spill over the panels. Just lightly poke the tip of your brush inside the recess and capillarity does the rest, leading the pigments where they should go. Looks like there are a few extra black elements. And a few more recesses to paint. To work on the other part separately, I am shaping pieces of aluminium wire into simple holders that are then glued to both arms and the backpack. This will give me a lot of mobility to paint them. Next, the left arm. The sculpt is pretty simple, but as with every intercessors, it is a very dynamic and important part of the model. You might be wondering why I am not simply painting the whole chain blade in black, and you'll be right to ask. The reason is, I was initially planning on painting a classic black and yellow stripes pattern for the sword and didn't want to add any more paint than I had to. But as you will see later, I went for something very different in the end. For the right arm, I am painting this heavy bolt pistol fully in black, avoiding to cover the purity seal. And again, over the backpack exhaust or whatever those parts are called. Same as on the armor, I am applying the black wash to every recess on the backpack. And you can clearly see that this simple step alone is adding a lot of separation to all those details. On the shoulder pads, I find using this a lot easier, cleaner and more natural looking than lining with a regular paint. For the laser bits, I am using a base of Valero Burnt Amber applied in multiple thin coats for a clean and smooth finish. Valero Air Paints are actually designed for airbrushing and are both very thin and transparent. I wouldn't usually recommend them for brushwork, but because of their consistency, they do work pretty well for layering. But honestly, one of the reasons why I am using those here is because a lot of our paints are from this range. Let's have a look at this old bottle of Mephiston Red. Oh, look at that mess. There is no way I can restore that paint, but I might be able to harvest some pigments. I am going to add some matte medium, demineralized water, and a good shake. Who am I kidding? Only a vortex mixer is going to do anything to that goo. And thousands of rotations later, this looks a lot better. And I should be able to use it for a first pass on all the highlighted parts. While I am not going for a strong heavy metal style, I do want some subtle edge highlights on every panel. I know that a lot of people don't enjoy painting edge highlights because it does require some brush control and a bit of practice to get a clean look. One valuable advice I could give is to not rush it and to slowly breathe out while painting an edge to reduce shakiness. This and a lot of practice will make your hand a lot steadier and faster. But personally, I find it very therapeutic and once started, I get in the zone with some good music in my ears and can keep at it for hours. Which is a good thing, I suppose, as those damn Space Marines have a shit ton of panels to highlight. Do you remember that time when Space Marines used to have way simpler designs? Crazy how much more details they have become. Actually, I am pretty curious to know which Space Marines were you first and would love if you could share this with us in the comments. Okay, this is starting to take shape and we can now pass to the next step to highlight some of the panels themselves with that same Mephiston Red. And for this, I am using layering to apply each layer as a very thin and transparent coat. 
to make sure that it is smoothly blending with the base color underneath. You really got to be patient with this technique and make sure that you don't load your brush to avoid pigments washing over the surface of the mini the moment you touch it. It takes some time, but if you want a very clean and smooth finish, this is worth it. I repeat the same process with the left arm that features a stylus gauntlet. I really like this sculpt. It is simple and not overloaded with details, which is something that we tend to see more and more these days. Same goes for the right arm and its lovely elbow pad. Some people seem to despise painting backpacks because, well, they all look more or less the same and once you paint in 10 of them, I guess it can get a little repetitive. But if you are not painting a piece for a competition, you definitely have the very legitimate option to do the bare minimum on those as the backpack doesn't need to catch as much attention as the rest of the model. Well, this is my first miniature in 20 years, so I am going to enjoy painting every single bit of it to a nice start out. This round element in the middle is very satisfying to highlight and it might be because I particularly enjoy painting curves. For the lenses, I am using Valero Black Green as a base, keeping it thin and smooth and avoiding to spill over the red parts of the helmet. I'll get back to those later, but for now, let's paint some leather starting with the holster. I am not fully confident about my ability to paint a good leathery texture, so let's see if I can pull something off. I am using Valero Flat Brown to add some texture to the leather, which is something I need to practice to get better at. But I am not stressing it here, as I don't want those parts to grab too much attention anyway. To highlight the lenses, I am using Valero Escorpina Green, and it was quite tempting to add some OSL to the helmet, but I chose to keep it simple this time. Next, I use a mix of German Grey and Pale Grey Blue to highlight the chest piece the joints, and all the other parts painted in black, repeating the process with some extra pale grey blue on a few edges. It is often easier to use the side of the brush rather than the tip to get a quick and clean edge. Same for the bolter gun, with a few highlights to make it look a little more interesting. I have this red matte by Life Color to paint the second round of highlights on the armor, and I am going to apply it wherever the surface is likely to be more exposed to the light. I don't remember exactly why we bought a few of those life color paints years ago, but they are very nice, smooth and highly pigmented paints. This is another example of painting with whatever you have at your disposal, but this range of paint is actually really nice to work with and I am glad that I got to experiment with it on this model. third round of highlights by adding a bit of game color sun yellow to that life color red. But this time I am only painting the very top of each highlight where the attention is likely to linger, like on the pads, the helmet and a few panels. This third pass of highlights really makes all those details pop, but might feel a bit overkill if you need to paint several squads for tabletop pieces. But really, you don't have to and you could still get an amazing look on a game-ready miniature by just adding those highlights to the helmet and the most important parts of the model. For a full-on heavy metal style though, I would even go further by adding a touch of white and yellow mix to each corner. Alright, this looks good enough. But let's not forget his backpack so his enemies can get distracted by all those pretty details while trying to shoot him in the back. But come on, those are really screaming for some nice edge highlighting. I thought for a long time about which color scheme to use for the pauldrons and eventually I decided to go for black with a few thin and smooth layers of Valero Air Black. And because the recruit edition of the starter set doesn't come with decals for the Blood Angels but only the Ultramarines, I have no choice but to add some freehand painting to the Spodrons. 
Notice how the red armor suddenly appears way too desaturated and that you can even spot some texture on the podrons? This is what happens when you change your mind twice over the stylistic design of the heraldry and that in the end, you settle back for the first one that you fully painted before. So I had to cover up those brush strokes from past iterations with a matte varnish that has seen better days and that really sucked out all the life from that red armor. Oh well, I can fix that later, but for now, let's focus on making it symmetrical, which isn't always the easiest, even on this kind of simpler freehand. Freehand painting might be one of the scariest but most rewarding aspects of miniature painting, as it gives you the ability to add new details and elements to a model. Here, I am doing my best to build clean foundations for the wings, but being the third time that I'm doing it, I am running a little out of patience on this one. Working on curved surfaces like this can be really tricky for symmetry. So, if you are struggling with matching both sides, start by adding a few dots for measurements, as it can really help nailing down proportions and make the whole thing much easier. Here, I am refining the wings, shape and edges by outlining it with Valeroya Black, building this design from both in the inside and the outside. Okay, done with the base layer, now time to add some color. I directly painted the middle of the blood drop in red to make it really vibrant, but on second thought, I should have started by applying a light brown to the whole thing. This way, I wouldn't have to paint this thin frame separately. This is not a big deal, but a little bit of planning can go a long way in making this easier and cleaner. Then, with a mix of brown and yellow, I am building a gold-like frame, trying to work some form of NMM on this tiny surface. For the final part of this design, I am giving a bit of volume to that blood gem by adding both shadows and highlight to it. To fix the earlier issues that I had with both the old varnish and those nasty paint strokes on the podron, we ordered this varnish by Valero Mecha Matte. This is a really good range and a hard lesson on pushing too far with using your old stuff. Alright, I managed to fix most of those nasty brush strokes on the podrons by gently smoothing down the surface with a sanding sponge. And with this, I can now add another coat on the top that will be nice, smooth and vibrant. This is so much better, and as you can see, as long as you don't paint with thick layers, even those kind of mistakes can be easily fixed. Now that the free hand is finished, I can continue on the bolter gun, its pretty seal and that chain blade. And because I somehow decided that I wouldn't use metallic paints on this model, I am painting the metal part in a low effort NMM, because at this stage, I just wanted to complete this miniature and get on with editing and sharing this video. The purity seal is a simple one, but I did take the time to add some simile writing to it for extra eye candy on the weapon. Again, a perk of having those arms detachable is to be able to paint them separately when you need to reach for some aqua places. I have a few parts to fix with black here along the chain because yes, I did go a little sloppy when painting those teeth. A brighter highlight on the edges of the chain is enough to make it stand out. While for the frame, a few scratches will do the job just fine. We'll keep the fancy freehand for a dedicated video. I must apologize here for those shots that are a little out of focus, because it might be hard for you to see just how crispy those details really are. A few extra highlights here and there are on the sword and this miniature is pretty much done. With the miniature itself complete, I had to make something a little extra for the base. For this base, I am going to use a small piece of slate stone as a rock that I broke from a bigger one and over which I am trying the miniature to find the best position. A bit of hot glue is enough to secure the stone to the base. And to add some texture, I found some old Valero white pumice that should still work well enough, applying it with a wooden stick all around the plastic base and filling up every gap to make it merge with the rock part. I am trying to not make a big mess out of this, but you can always go back with water and a brush to clean this up. Mm -hmm. 
I am then adding a few tiny fragments of that same slate stones to the pumice to help making the whole base more consistent. For priming the base, I am using Valero Ghost Grey Surface Primer with a few drops of thinner and flow improver. I also secure the base to this piece of cardboard with double tape to avoid sending the base flying while spraying it with the airbrush. Same as for the miniature, I am spraying the paint in thin layers, making sure to flash dry by blowing air over the base between each application. To paint the texture on the rock, I'll be using Valero Air Pale Blue, but as this paint is very old, it is going to need a lot of strong mixing before being able to use it for dry brushing. I actually forgot to press record while further airbrushing the base. And you know what? This is happening more often than you might think. For dry brushing, I am using a nice small makeup brush, rubbing it on a piece of paper towel to remove most of the paint. Then, delicately brushing over the rock, I am highlighting the texture by applying a very small amount of paint. And as for layering, you will have more control and get better results by applying multiple passes rather than a single sloppy one. On the top of that, I am going to dry brush that same pale blue mixed with a small amount of white. After all that dry brushing, I need to bring back some contrast over the rock texture by applying a black wash very similar to the one I used on the miniature and avoiding to pass it over the brightest part of the rock. And voila, the base is done and I just need to make a few fitting tests to be sure that I'm choosing the right angle before gluing it to the miniature. This blood and joint assessor is now complete and it feels pretty damn good to wrap up this miniature. And there you go, we hope that you enjoyed it, take care and we'll see you in the next video, see ya!